Good afternoon. Welcome to our pre-recorded session, which is an integral part of our live project management webinar. My name is Veronica Gonshur, and I'm a senior finance and operations officer in Largas, and I will guide you through your contractual obligations as beneficiaries of Erasmus Plus Corporation and Small Scale Partnership Projects. Your brand agreement is a legally binding document between you, the beneficiary of the Erasmus Plus program, and Largas, the national agency. The aim of your project, uh, of your grant agreement, is to ensure smooth management of your project. Your grant agreement clearly defines your roles and responsibilities, obligations of other beneficiaries, which are project partners, and the national agency. It clarifies what projects are to do and when, and confirms all changes recommended to your project during the evaluation and contracting process. The agreement is split into several sections and annexes, including the main body, special conditions, Annex 1, General Conditions, Addendum to the Grant Agreement covering the issue of virtual activities. Annex 2, Providing Description of the Project, Estimated Budget of the Project and List of Other Beneficiaries. Annex 3, With Financial and Contractual Rules. And Annex 4, With Applicable Rates. This annex is only applicable to cooperation partnerships. Annex 5, With Mandate. When reviewing your grant agreement, please make sure that you do know which part of it takes precedence over which. Provisions included in special conditions of the grant agreement take precedence over all annexes. Annex 1, general conditions, will take precedence over remaining annexes. Annex 3, financial and contractual rules, takes precedence over Annex 2, 4 and 5. Within Annex 2, the part of the estimated budget takes precedence over the part on the description of the project. There are several articles in special conditions that we wish to highlight to you, and these are Article 1.2, which states duration of your project and its start and end date. All your project activities must take place between specified start and end date, otherwise they will be deemed ineligible. Article 1.3 specifies the amount of your awarded grant, which might be slightly different, from the amount you originally applied for. During the evaluation phase, the national agency assesses your grant requests and might introduce some reductions when feels that some requested costs are ineligible or were incorrectly applied. Please note that the awarded grant cannot be increased in any circumstances. Article 1.17 will provide you details on possible budget transfer without a formal amendment to the grant agreement. Special conditions very clearly define your project's payment and reporting arrangements, both in Article 1.4. Grant agreements are issued to beneficiaries in two copies. Whilst they are signed by the legal representative of your organization, they are returned to Largas to be co-signed by our executive director. Once our executive director co-signs two copies of the grant agreement, a first pre-financing payment is raised and made to a project's bank account as specified in Article 1.5. In majority of projects with a duration of up to 24 months, the first pre-financing payment will represent 70% of the total awarded grant. Up to 30% will be then paid to the project upon the receipt and successful evaluation of its final report. A different payment schedule might be applied to some of the projects at the discretion of Lorgas in instances where the beneficiaries have weaker financial capacity, poor liquidity, good track record in terms of repayments of refunds or late reporting. These issues are taken into account during risk assessment and financial capacity check carried out as part of the evaluation process. For all key action two projects of duration over 24 months, 80% of the awarded grant will be paid in two installments during the project. The first 40% upon the signature of the grant agreement and the second 40% towards the second half of the project. Up to 20% is then paid to the project upon the receipt and successful evaluation of its final report. Also in this case, payments can be split even further depending on the results of the risk assessment and financial capacity check where applicable. The national agency has a certain number of days to make relevant payments. It is 30 days from the signature of the contract for the first payment and 60 days from the receipt of the final report for the final payment. All Key Action 2 projects are required to submit a final report. 
depending on the project duration and the results of the risk assessment and financial capacity check carried out by Largas as part of the evaluation process, you may need to submit additional progress or interim report. Your grant agreement includes information on the reporting structure for your project and the deadlines for report submission in Article 1.4. Please be also familiar with terminology used. Reporting period means a defined period of time for which you will provide description of activities carried out and costs incurred. Reporting deadline is when your report is due. You will have 60 days from the end date of your project to submit your final report via an online Erasmus Plus reporting and management tool. By submitting the final report, you are requesting a final payment to be made to your project. The final report is evaluated against quality criteria in line with the approved project and scored up to 100 points. If the final report is recognized as of poor quality, partial or late implementation, a reduction to its reported grant may happen if the project scores below 60 points. It is vital that you do provide as much as possible information on the implementation of your project to showcase its quality, benefits and achievements. Interim report is submitted during the project and is closely linked to project stage payment structure being a result of the project's duration or evaluation of beneficiaries' financial and organizational performance. An interim report is an ace way to monitor your project's quality implementation, but also financial expenditure over a defined period of time, which is clearly stated in Article 1.4.3. By submitting an interim report, beneficiaries request that further pre-financing payment is made to their bank account during the project. Such pre-financing payment is indeed made once the report passes the evaluation and also when it shows that beneficiaries spent at least 70% of the first pre-financing made to the project upon the signature of the grant agreement. Beneficiaries are allowed to submit an interim report either by deadline or when the 70% rule is fulfilled which means that an interim report can be also submitted before the deadline specified in the grant agreement. In a situation when the interim report is due, but beneficiary's expenditure is still below 70% threshold, the interim report still needs to be submitted for evaluation purposes, and the further one will be then requested once the 70% threshold is met. An interim report is submitted via an online Erasmus Plus reporting and management tool, and relevant feedback and recommendations are provided by the national agency to beneficiaries following the evaluation. The aim of the progress report is also to outline the progress of the project's implementation over a defined period of time, also clearly stated in Article 1.4.3. However, its submission is not linked to the payment. Article 1.5 provides, uh, provides specifics of your project's bank details. You will find it on the signature page of your grant agreement. It is essential to let us know if your project bank details change. Such change requires a formal amendment to the grant agreement and it is vital both for you and us that we make payments to correct and valid bank accounts. It is very important that you do understand our and your responsibilities regarding processing of personal data. For this reason, please read carefully Article 1.6 and 1.8 of Special Conditions, as well as Articles 2.3 and 2.7 of General Conditions. These articles will give you an overview of a data controller, definitions of communication details, means and their format for both you as the beneficiary and also Largus. They will also highlight your right to access, rectify, erase your own personal data as well as your right to restrict data portability or to object to data processing. But they will also outline your obligations as a beneficiary when processing of personal data, including providing the participants with the relevant privacy statement before they are encoded for the reporting purposes in Commission's tools. As a beneficiary, you are also required to implement effective procedures and arrangements that will ensure safety and protection of your project's participants, including health and safety requirements, carrying out risk assessment on travel, receiving organizations, accommodations, or implementing safeguarding measures where necessary. You are also obliged to ensure that both insurance coverage and financial support is provided to participants to allow them to take part in the project. 
you should also provide adequate pre financing to participants with fewer opportunities taking part in learning, teaching, and training activities. In particular, they may not be requested to personally pre finance their activities. When managing Erasmus Plus project, you will become familiar with Erasmus Plus a reporting and management tool, which is an online monitoring and reporting tool created to support beneficiaries in encoding their activities, details of eligible participants and reporting projects expenditure. You are contractually obliged to update the tool on a regular basis. This will help you to maintain a clear overview of your project's progress. The use of Erasmus Plus results platform is also compulsory for all key action tool projects. You will be able to update the platform on your project results at final report stage. The use of the Erasmus Plus results platform is a good way of showcasing your project and its tangible deliverables. Whether you are directly responsible for the management of your project or promoting the funding opportunities available, you are required to use the European Commission's Erasmus Plus emblem and associated wording for any project outputs and promotional materials produced, and to publicly acknowledge the support received from the European Union, which includes events, conferences, and seminars. When acknowledging the support received, there are a range of ways to display the emblem, wording, and a disclaimer, and relevant guidelines are provided through the link included in Article 1.13. We strongly recommend that you visit this webpage as it does provide a very comprehensive guidelines on how to acknowledge the EU support. We also recommend that you carefully read Article 1.20, which includes specific derogations from Annex 1, general conditions. However, customized to each project, Key Action to Grant Agreement is a generic template also applicable to centralized actions managed directly by the executive agency in Brussels. And as a result, some articles in Act 1 might be read differently. Please always double check Article 120 when referring to specific articles in Annex 1, General Conditions. General Conditions Annex 1 to the main body of your grant agreement starts with three important articles, which provide definition of various terms used in the grant agreement, describe your roles and responsibilities as both the beneficiary and the coordinating partner, describe roles and responsibilities of the remaining project partners, and define how the official communication between different parties involved in the project should look like. In addition, Article 2.9 defines your rights and the right of the European Union regarding the ownership and use of the results, including project results and industrial property rights, and Articles 2.10 and 2.11 will provide rules regarding award of contracts and subcontracting of tasks, respectively. As is the nature of projects such as these, several changes may take place throughout the project life cycle. If anything unexpected occurs, please communicate it clearly to Largus to see what can be done. It will often be the case that these changes can be accounted for through amendments to your contract, which could include changes as large as project activities or as small as bank account details. Amendment requests need to be made in writing directly to the national agency, have to be justified, solved before the relevant activity takes place, and at least one month before the end date of the project. Where necessary, they should be accompanied by additional supporting documentation. Some changes will always require a formal amendment to the grant agreement, and these are change of the legal representative, change of the duration of the project, withdrawal and replacement of a project partner, change of bank details, change of the beneficiary's legal status and address, and some budget changes. This list is not exhaustive. There might be some other changes not listed here, which will also require a formal amendment to the grant agreement. In any case, if you are planning on introducing some changes to your project, please do contact us to discuss them, and we will be able to provide you with relevant advice and support. The amendment process involves completion of an amendment request form by the beneficiary, its assessment and further approval or decline by the national agency. If a proposed change requires a formal amendment to the grant agreement, two copies of amended article will be issued to your legal representative, and once signed, they will be returned to us, co-signed by Larga's executive director, and one copy will be returned to you, while the other one will be kept on file in Larga's. 
In cases where your project activities could not go ahead due to unforeseeable circumstances beyond the participant's control and not due to his or her negligence or error, and if you did incur expenditure which you cannot now recover, you may wish to apply for force majeure. Application for force majeure has to be submitted in writing using a force majeure form. The request needs to be duly justified and accompanied by supporting documentation if or where needed. Given these very unprecedented circumstances we are still finding ourselves in, we do strongly advise that before booking travel, accommodation or any other project activities, you do check the relevant government guidance and support channels as part of your project's risk management. In Articles 2.16 and 2.17 of General Conditions, it is clearly specified in what circumstances suspension or early termination of your project might happen. Both suspension or early termination of the project and the grant agreement might happen at any point at the request of both the beneficiary and the national agency. In both instances, a formal notification will be required. What really is essential to understand here is the importance of communication between the project and the national agency. We would like to you to keep communication channels open to let us know about any issues or problems you may come across and experience during your project. Part B of the general condition also includes several important articles which are highlighted here. Some of them have already been covered or will be covered during the project management webinar. Therefore, for purposes of this session, I would like to only highlight the importance of the following ones for you. Article 2.23 emphasizes the need for timely submission of your reports. Failure to submit reports or submit them on time may result in your project being suspended or terminated and the recovery of your grant. If you anticipate any delays with submission of any of your reports, please do communicate this to us in advance. Article 2.27 lists all potential checks your project may be subject to from either the national agency or any other relevant external bodies such as commission themselves or the European Court of Auditors, for example. Those checks are always communicated in advance. Please note that all your project's documentation need to be kept for five years after Lorcas makes the final payment to your project unless the awarded grant was lower than 60,000 in which case the period for keeping project's documentation is limited to three years after the date of the final payment. For all projects funded in 2021, the grant agreement will include an addendum. This addendum is a direct result of the impact COVID-19 had and still has on Key Action 2 projects. The Commission recognizing significant barriers in delivery of project activities during the pandemic proposed some flexible measures, including a possibility of delaying planned physical activities or carrying them out via virtual means. This addendum is a response to the latter option and outlines both financial and contractual implications of organizing virtual activities instead of physical ones due to COVID-19. You will receive your grant agreement together with the addendum. Both the grant agreement and the addendum are to be signed by your project's legal representative in two copies and sent back to Lorcas for the signature of our executive director. Whilst co-signed, one copy of the grant agreement and the addendum will be returned to you and one will be kept on file in Lorcas. We recommend that you do carry out a risk assessment of your project activities and their original timeframes in order to decide which option proposed by the Commission you wish to avail of. If you decide to organize a virtual activity, you will need to complete a virtual activity request form, which will be further reviewed and approved uh, or declined by the national agency. Please note that virtual activities should only take place following DNA's approval. Annex 2 to the grant agreement includes description of the project by referencing your original project application and it also provides a breakdown of your awarded grant, the details of the beneficiary and a list of project partners. There is a significant difference between how Annex 2 is going to look like for Key Action 220 cooperation partnership projects and small scale partnerships. This difference is a direct result of a different structure of the application form and funding itself. 
cooperation partnership projects will observe Annex 2 built on the basis of grant headings as seen on this slide, whereas Annex 2 for small scale partnership projects will provide a breakdown of relevant awarded lump sum into estimated costs for each activity approved by LARGAS during the evaluation process. Annex 3, Financial and Contractual Rules, is a very important document which defines conditions for eligibility of costs and activities, rules regarding the use of unit costs and real costs for Key Action 220 projects, and rules applicable for actions based on lump sums, the latter applicable to small-scale partnership projects. Annex 3 will outline when the costs are eligible and what evidence you need to keep for each awarded cost. It will also provide you with very clear guidance on what evidence needs to be kept for each type of Key Action 2 project and when your grant might be reduced. It also outlines different types of checks that can be performed in respect to your project by LARCAS. Full scope of Annex 3 is, is covered during the live project management webinar. Annex 4 is only applicable to Key Action uh, 220 cooperation partnership projects and lists applicable rates for project management implementation, transnational project meetings, project results, multiplier events, inclusion support for organizations, as well as learning, teaching and training activities in respect to travel, both standard and green, individual support for both staff and youth workers and learners and young people, and linguistic support. These are the same rates which are embedded in the application form and which you used when completing it. Annex 5 uh, includes mandates. Mandates are in fact letters of intent confirming the willingness of the beneficiary and consortium members to participate in the project and act in compliance with contractual obligations as set in the grant agreement which Irish beneficiary signs on behalf of the project consortium. Each mandate is signed by your legal representative and also legal signatory of the relevant project partner. In majority of cases, mandates included in this annex are the same as those submitted with the application forms, unless some details have changed during the period between the application submission and contracting process. I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you all good luck with your projects. We are here to support you, so please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions related to Erasmus Plus program or your projects. We are looking forward to working with you. Thank you.